a preacher with no voice on Pentecost Sunday, that's not a guy to be. I just want to say uh, <clears throat> so grateful for everyone who covered for us when we went back to uh, Michigan to uh, visit uh, with family when, for my grandmother's passing and got to see a lot of family while we were back there and had a great time and, um, you know, just appreciate everybody filling in and doing everything and, and it's been tough to be away. I miss my bed. We got home and then the next day we went to men's conference, so it's like busy, 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 but... I was glad to be able to sleep in my own bed last night after a more, little more than a week, I think. And, yeah, but it was a blessing to be able to go. And so uh, thank you, everybody who filled in and you know, jumped right in there. Awesome. Well, today is Pentecost Sunday, and we're going to take a look at the perspective of what that means. And this morning, uh, again, my voice is um, gone. And uh, so I don't know when you did you start the recording? All right. Um, it's, uh, my voice is of great concern. As you know, last year I lost it for a few months and it's, I'm suffering from the same thing again. It actually physically hurts to talk or to do anything. So I'm going to have to, uh, see what else is going on. So pray for me to covet that. And I thank you for that. Uh, but if you have your Bibles, open the scriptures with me to Ephesians chapter five. And we're going to start Ephesians chapter five, verse 18. The beginning part of the verse says, do not be drunk with wine, but then it goes on in part B there and says, instead be filled with the Spirit. Speak to one another with psalms, hymns and spiritual songs, sing and make music in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the real focus, to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about the preciousness of of the power of God and the infilling of the Holy Spirit in every believer who asks. If I were Satan and wanted to destroy and thwart God's kingdom purposes in the church, I would do one of two things. Number one, I would do everything I could to undermine God's word, to make it seem irrelevant. I would try to put things in it, add things to it, take away from it, manipulate it. I would create movies about people trying to administer the word of God and misquoting it or living it wrong. I would create all kinds of television programs that undermine the sayings of God's word. I would create a pop culture that was disingenuous towards God's word and, and was total opposite of anything that God's word had to say. That would be number one. Secondly, and, and, and probably equally as powerfully as important, if I were Satan and wanted to destroy the church, I would take away the people, I would distract them from wanting or desiring anything to do with the Holy Spirit. And for the church people to ignore the Holy Spirit to this degree, um, I would be very prolific if I was Satan. I would do whatever I could to get people distracted by being too busy to wait on the Lord. I would get them, I would remove altar invitations from church for people to seek the Holy Spirit, much like we're going to do this morning. I would take that out of the church so that we just hear good, encouraging three points in a poem and we go home without any application, that's what I would do to the church. I think that's exactly what Satan has done and is doing today in our culture. So what does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? What does it look like to you? If you were raised in a very conservative, maybe a fundamentalist type church, Baptist, mainline, uh, Presbyterian, Lutheran, um, even, even though there's good, solid biblical, biblical doctrine, you, you were raised in maybe a more a conservative setting where um, I... I Conservative is the wrong word. Uh, uh, maybe a little less uh, receptive to and the moving of the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the baptism in the Holy Spirit as another work that God wants to do in the life of the believer with signs following. Maybe you were raised in a charismatic church where, and I was raised in the old line church of God, right? Where we had Jericho marches during worship service after. We, you know, they had all kinds of the, the preaching and the fiery guy up there and just yelling it. You know, everybody's being prayed for, and they're crying out to God, and some are you know, different postures, laying on the floor, whatever. That was not uncommon when I was a kid. It was something that was very predominant. So in this room, all of you, all of you and myself included, come from different perspectives that are not necessarily wrong or whatever. But what we need to do this morning, I think, is kind of put that on pause just for a moment 
and take our experience and maybe try to set it aside just for a little bit, although your experience is not unimportant, I'm not implying that, but to be able to take a look at what God intends for his people in terms of being filled with the Spirit. So if you were, you know, it depends on where you come from, and maybe you handled rattlesnakes, or maybe everybody folded their hands and quietly prayed like this. No matter what your religious tradition or where you come from, you and I, we carry these stereotypes, well, maybe a lot of baggage and, and different things. And, but God wants us to be open to what he has for us with, with and by the power of the Holy Spirit. For, for some, we talk a lot about the Holy Spirit. I've heard people even boast about this and that. But is the fruit of the Holy Spirit coming out of our lives? Others uh, talk about the Holy Spirit maybe in just a plain theological term and never experience the Holy Spirit working in their life. And, and many simply ignore the Holy Spirit. And many have uh, had no experience at all, no intimacy with the Holy Spirit. And the significance of that is, is, is really sad. A.W. Tozer, uh, that powerful man of word and, and wrote uh, an essential writing on prayer, writes this about us <clears throat> in comparison to others. He says, we may as well face it. The whole level of spirituality among us is low. We have measured ourselves by ourselves until the incentive to seek higher plateaus and the things of the Spirit is all but gone. We have imitated the world, sought popular favor, uh, manufactured delights to substitute for the joy of the Lord, and produced a cheap and synthetic power to substitute for the power of the Holy Ghost. This is so true. There's a lot of things in life that move me. If, if I had the ability to sing this morning, which I don't, I could sing, you know, oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light in my best voice. And maybe we would all be moved because we're American. We love this song. It makes us think about the many who have given their lives uh, for our freedom or many that we just, we just love that, right? It's moving. I remember a couple years ago in America's Got Talent, that little Jackie Ivanko, you know, she, she sings opera. And I'm not a big fan of opera music. But I got a couple of her albums on my on my phone because she, you know, to hear that beautiful voice with so much tone and quality come out of this little, you know, nine year old girl or whatever, however old she was, it's just fascinating to me, and it moves me. I listen to her and I'm almost in tears. I love music, so, um, but then again, I'm almost in tears when I listen to Striper too. So, but I, I, anyway, but I, I I love music. So, but I I I listen to that and I'm, I'm just like wow. That's so powerful, and there's a lot of things that move us. And if we did some things up here, we, we told a story or put on a dramatic event, or, or we, if we had the lights go in a certain way during worship, maybe that would move us, and we might have an emotional response. But the, the Holy Spirit's work is more than emotional response. It's more than pride in country or, or a good feeling. He is a person of God who genuinely desires to fill every believer with his power. And we need his power. His power is the thing that satisfies. Oh, the song we sang first said it so well. You know, oh God, a burning, cleansing flame. Send the fire. Your blood-bought church today we claim. Send the fire. We need another Pentecost. In the fire. And when we look around our culture today, there is an appetite, I think, that we as Christians need to nurture that is opposite what the world is saying. And it is an appetite for the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a lot of people in this world in mainline denomination that love the Lord and they're going to heaven, but they believe in this thing called cessationalism. Anybody ever heard this term? It's a theological term. Cessationalists believe that all of the miraculous, powerful works that Jesus did, the healings, um, turning the water to wine, the miraculous, the powerful things that Jesus did, and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and all the things that happened through the church, raising dead people, uh, speaking in tongues, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, they believe they ended after the first church age. And they believe they have biblical reason for this. And so if you were raised in a mainline denomination, your cessationalist theology is, is in there. This is a 
firm belief in many in Baptist denominations, for example. But the thing of it is, and, and, and this is so powerfully true, is if that were the case theologically, if that if we were to seek that, then why has there been so many outbursts of the Holy Spirit for centuries? And why is the Holy Spirit so predominant today? It wasn't just a few years ago we had a uh, some services here. We were talking about the Holy Spirit, and we invited people to come and pray to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And a little gal, her name is Cherry and Bow. She's a wonderful woman of God. They moved and built a house down south of Lacey and eventually found a church. They drove for the longest time because they wanted to come to church here. But she's a little Filipino girl, four foot nothing, right? I mean, she's just this little, just the cutest lady and wonderful family. And she wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And she's praying. She's earnestly seeking God. And, and, and all I did was I come over and I began to pray with her. And she <laughs> exploded with this just montage of praise you Jesus and tongues and everything else was coming out of her. And, and, and it could tell, you know, she was just taken in. And it was the most beautiful thing. Uh, one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. I've seen it many times. Um, but that's just an illustration to show us if God really is done, then those of us who have opened up our lives and have sensed his power and have experienced his indwelling and have had seen the gifts manifested through our lives, then why is that still present? So God wants to do something. And some people say that what we need to do is find a balance between the cessationalists and the chandelier swingers. So what we have to do is, rather than handle rattlesnakes or just sit quietly and fold our hands, we have to find a happy medium. Friends, i got to tell you, if God's thing is here and he's doing it, I'm not going to be afraid of it. I'm not saying we're going to bring out the rattlesnakes today. But I'm saying... Why not all of Jesus, if he says, I'm going to pour my spirit out on my church and these things are going to happen and signs following, then why not? Jesus said, greater things you will do than what I've done. So these things should be coming out of God's people. Some say, I've got Jesus. Why do I need the Holy Spirit? I think this is the missing element. The church is primarily a gathering of us believers together. Sharing life together, loving one another, desiring to be close to Jesus, experience his presence together. We are, we are together. We love the Lord. But in um, America, I think more than in Europe especially, that the church really has stopped somewhere between the cross and Pentecost. That we've kind of settled for a happy middle. And church growth can happen in lots of other ways. If we have a lot of money, we can put on large programs we can uh, advertise to the community a whole bunch of things. If we had uh, this or that resource, we could have the most talented preachers, worship leaders, bands or whatever come in and draw a crowd. But this doesn't mean, even though some of those things may not be bad it, necessarily, it doesn't mean that the Holy Spirit is actively working and moving in the lives of people who are coming. All it means is that we have created an appealing thing enough to draw people for one hour on Sundays. When people come to church and they, they leave church, usually what we hear is, man, what a great worship service or what a great sermon today. But what if instead of that, we heard, oh, God was here. The Holy Spirit was in that place. We were moved because God was here. He was speaking to my heart. He was he was bringing things to my mind. I had been in church before where the preacher was preaching. But honestly, I didn't hear a word he said because I was so saturated with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was speaking to my heart. What if we left church by announcing the things that God has done rather than how good the church was or how loving the people were? As good as those things are, there's nothing wrong with having good preaching. <laughs> That's not a bad preaching. That would be bad. But we need the Holy Spirit also because he makes us family. The Holy Spirit's work is to change us and to heal our spirit, to give us power for life, service, and witness, and, and to make us sorrowful over sin for repentance. And this is the work of the Holy Spirit, the very first work. And, but what it does is as God begins to work in us, he makes us more like family, that we resemble 
the one who made us. Amen. We have his image. We are his children. We take, we've taken on the family name. We have a family inheritance. We have, we have the family likeness. When I was back in Michigan, um, Pam come, come in several times at how much I look like everybody, you know. And we all look the, the same because we're all related, you know. And I've got a lot of family. I've got, you know, dads that had 12 kids on one side and 10 on the other, and some died. And so I've got all these cousins, some I don't even know. They come up, give me a hug, and I don't even know who they are. And I, I'm learning who they are. But we have, we are family because the Spirit of God makes us family. And we, we begin to take on the likeness of Jesus. And we, we begin to love each other. And we begin to show that love. And we need that work in our life because the work, first work of the Holy Spirit is to convict us over our sin. Amen? And I need to rehearse this. It's really important before we get into the, all the other stuff because we need the Holy Spirit to transform us from intimacy with sin to intimacy with Jesus. Romans 8, 9, Paul writes, You, however, are not controlled by the sinful nature, but by the Spirit. If the Spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to Christ. What a powerful statement. There, there is much more to God on following in the way of Jesus than getting a bunch of talented people together to hold a church service. And intimacy with Jesus means intimacy and, and being filled with his Holy Spirit. And, and that statement he puts in there that those, they do not belong to Christ. But we cannot know Jesus without the Holy Spirit. We can't be a Christian without relationship with the Holy Spirit. We cannot experience freedom from sin without the Holy Spirit. And, and, and I wish I could describe it to you. It is so hard, I think, for those of us who have been filled, baptized in God's Holy Spirit. Maybe you've come to Christ and you've been saved, and, but you've never really been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Let me try to explain, and, and like Ricky said to Lucy, explain it to you as best I can. can. I remember when I was a kid at kids camp in sixth grade, I had been saved. I had been led to the Lord by my mother at our kitchen table, but I had come to know and a great hunger in my life for more of God. And I was in sixth grade at a kids camp, and at this kids camp, there's this altar, and at kids camp, parents can come too. Because if you have a wild child, like Pam and I, you can go with them. I won't tell you which one. Initials is Justin. Anyway, so uh, he's not in here. He's teaching kids church right now. Turns around. Life turns around. It's beautiful. So anyway, and the, the parents, it's beautiful, and, and we have these wonderful times in the cabin. And horse, and of course, parents don't like that part. But anyway, we're at the altar, and we're kids camp, and we're praying. And the speaker that year was a woman, and she was a fabulous job, and, and she was just talking to us about the Holy Spirit. That's always the third night, right? It's always Wednesday night. The first night's about salvation. The second night is dropping things off, you know, baggage, things. Third night's always about Holy Spirit. It's always about Holy Spirit. I mean, it's like, I can tell you the order of the preachers, that they, they do it on purpose. They, they get you at the first service, and then you're gone. You're just, you're going to, you're going to the mission field by Thursday, right? <laughs> so anyway, we're praying, and we're all there, and we're seeking God, and I'll never forget like a wave just poured over that front. And I just, I just started praising God and speaking in tongues. And I didn't know, you know, I, I had heard it because I had been growing up in church, but never really experienced it. And it just, I was just filled with the Holy Spirit. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. And from that point on, I would lay on my bed at night and I would pray and God's Spirit would come. And to describe it to you is like, I love Jesus but then he gives me this special touch. It's like a, a, a wave. And the feeling physically is also there. I felt warm from head to toe. I, 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 I felt energized in a way that, that I never knew could happen. I felt so much love. I felt like God's arms were wrapped around me. That's, that's what it's like. And and. Still, I lack the communicative ability to explain it to you because it must be experienced. Aaron and I would go to a Seahawks game. I wouldn't go, but anyway, uh, we go to a Seahawks game, and Aaron doesn't get a ticket. He has to go. He walks around the outside of Safeco Field. I don't know why. CenturyLink, whatever it is. 
So I'm in there, and I'm watching the football game or whatever, and yay, 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 yippee, skippy. We get done with the football game, and Aaron says, what was it like? Well, you know, this and that, and Wilson this and that, and this new guy that we got there. And then the, he said, wow, that sounds great. But I know. I've experienced the game. Aaron didn't. He's only hearing secondhand, and, and that's the way I feel today because the experience is with God. He is the baptizer. Jesus is the baptizer in the Holy Spirit. This thing that comes, the first work of the Holy Spirit, I'm getting ahead of myself because I don't know why, um, is the conviction of sin. I remember a young man coming into me years ago and said, I feel bad about my sin. People have their own sins, he said, but I really realize the grace of God and uh, I can pretty much do whatever I want. And um, what he didn't realize is that when the Holy Spirit comes into your life, he changes your desires and turns them upside down. That's another thing the Holy Spirit did in me. I, I began to have more interest in God things. And, and then, then if I were not filled with the Holy Spirit, I would have not have gone into Bible quiz as a young man and memorized the New Testament for competition. And it still rolls around inside my head today. And I rattle off things because the Holy Spirit was at work in my, in my life. Conviction for sin is the one thing of the Holy Spirit's primary roles. And it's important in our life. John 16, 7, the Bible says, They tell you the truth is good for you that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the counselor will not come. But if I go, I'll send him to you. When he comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. What's he going to do? He's going to make me feel bad about my sin. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. When, I, when I'm doing something I shouldn't or watching something I shouldn't or, or it comes on the computer, when I, I should feel guilt. I should feel a heaviness. I should feel the conviction of God in my life. It makes me feel bad. Why? So I, I will turn to him and, and he feel his goodness and his grace again. He's a loving father. He's got lots of kids. He wants to share his glory, the Holy Spirit on us. These actions, attitudes, and words of a sinful life are principally taught in the Bible and enforced by the Holy Spirit. If I were to just simply look at the Ten Commandments, have no other gods, don't idolize anything, don't misuse God's name, well, uh, work uh, for yourself every day except one day, take one to rest and honor God, uh, don't despise, reject, or criticize your parents, uh, don't kill anybody, or as Jesus says, don't call them a stupid idiot, uh, seven, uh, do not commit adultery, or Jesus says, don't even look with lust in your heart. Uh, number eight, don't cheat on your taxes or take money that isn't yours, especially God's money. Number nine, don't tell lies or half-truths about people behind their back. And number ten, don't be jealous and covet what other people have. Sure, that's the law, that's right. But something happens when you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You begin to understand these things are things that you dislike. These are things that you begin to hate. These are things that, because you're starting to love other kinds of stuff, and this is the work the Holy Spirit does. The list is huge. That Just the Ten Commandments, I mean, if we go through more of Scripture, it talks about lying, getting drunk, selfishness, hypocrisy, homosexuality, adultery, uh, pride, sexual perversion, wicked intentions, marrying an unbeliever, and on and on and on and on. And when I realized the Word, I began to more love the things God loves and hate the things he hates because the Holy Spirit is working in me. This is where the Holy Spirit really comes in. If we took a, take a look at our sin, what separates us from God and hell, we find Scripture defining. And then what he magnifies in our own heart, we begin to realize, God, I want what you want, love. And, and you see, sin is destructive. It tears our life apart. And sin is deceptive. It promises fulfillment. It creates addictions that never satisfy. It rapes the soul of a person without a new regard for the hope and dreams of life. And sin says, enjoy me. Sin says, stay bitter at that person. It'll make you feel better. Sin says, hey, date me. I'll grow on you even though I'm not a believer until we're married and then you're stuck with me. Sin says, I'm easier. There's no discipline required. Sin says, it's all about you. No consideration for what God wants or create your own definition of. You can just do whatever you want. Now, this kind of preaching is unpopular these days, I believe, because there's an absence of the Holy Spirit's work in the church. I think we are afraid to say these things because we don't feel like God's got our back. I, I'm expressing opinion here. 
But I, I feel like, friends, if Abundant Life was a church, and, and I know many of you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, I praise God. That, but, but what if when we left church, what God did was on our lips to those around us rather than what a great whatever we have here at the church? Good coffee, I don't know. This kind of preaching might be unpopular. Some might say it's not relevant. God's outdated. We don't really expect men and women to love and serve him. I think that the reason for the message not being the way that it used to be is, is because the absence of God's Holy Spirit's work in his church. And the work of the Holy Spirit is good. And we can, we can never know the grace of God until we're completely crushed by the weight of our sin. And, and the, the preaching about sin is important with the anointing of God. And the Holy Spirit restores us. And that's the Holy Spirit's work. Another thing that's so hard to describe about, and if you're baptized in the Holy Spirit, you've experienced this. There are things that go on in our lives that could be crushing, that destroy us, that, that want to take advantage of our situation. And when baptized in the Holy Spirit, there is a special strength that can be found in Christ that, that digs deep and says, I'm still here. Can't tell you the amount of times that I have, I have felt God's arms just wrap around me in the middle of desperate situations and circumstances. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals God's grace. We need a relationship with the Holy Spirit because without Him we are alone. Remember Jesus says, I'm going to prepare a place for you and I'm going to go away and the Father and, and from there um, the Bible says, I'm going to... Uh, going away, and finally he gives them the ultimate assurance. He says, another comforter will come. I'm leaving you, but another comforter will come. A counselor, Jesus said he would give them another person who's going to walk with them forever. And, and, and when we look at this, we look at uh, Jesus and walking with his disciples and going where they walked and went where they went and the boats they rode and the places they were and the things that they did and the eating of dinners and lunches and breakfasts and sleeping in the same areas and, and going and doing all this stuff. They were with Jesus. He was with them to heal them, to stop the wind and the waves. Jesus was right there to give them wisdom and direction. He was there to open their blind eyes. He was right there to give them counsel and assurance. They were following a strong teacher, a leader who was God. And yet Jesus says, I'm going away, but I'm giving you someone just like me. Oh, friends, why are we not taking advantage of this? It's like Jesus walking with us every moment of the day. The fullness of God's Holy Spirit in Greek, in this case, the word for another means another that is just like the first, as opposed to another that's a different kind of sort, and someone just like Jesus. So today, the work of the Holy Spirit is the work of Jesus, amplifying Jesus, talking about Jesus, with Jesus leading us for Jesus' things. Another one like him walking with us. Another Jesus ca carrying our fears. Another Jesus teaching us the words of life. Another Jesus loving us, leading us, and caring for us. That's the work of the Holy Spirit. To convict of sin and to counsel and to lead us and to guide us and to be with us. And Jesus says, greater things you'll do than these. Now that's a statement. Why aren't we seeing that? Maybe we're not asking every day for God to touch us. Afresh. Now, I know we're baptized in the Holy Spirit. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nobody can take that away. But are you be being filled? There's an emptying out. When you get filled up, you get poured out, right? When you get filled up, you get poured out. That's the purpose of the Christian life. Whether you want it or not, Monday's coming, and, and Monday's going to pour you out whether you like it or not. Right? And so we get filled with Jesus. We get filled with the Spirit every day. I think that's why Paul says, I die daily, because he recognizes his total dependence upon God for his daily strength. He recognized that, and he's the one that said, I'm glad I speak in tongues more than all of you. And, and he recognizes the significance. He, he knows the importance of being filled with the Spirit. If we could imagine Jesus right here with us, riding in the car with you, taking the kids to school, being right there as you're on the job, going to lunch, being with you. That would be amazing. That's what the Holy Spirit is to do. The reason why we may not be experiencing Jesus maybe like this is because we have no relationship and no seeking or desire for the Holy Spirit in our lives. Look at the descriptive of the, prof the prophecy concerning Jesus. And Isaiah says, 
Unto us a child is born, a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Now that's good stuff. That's the work of the Holy Spirit today in us. Paul's statement here to be filled with the Spirit is one that says to them that, that, that they have more to experience, that there is no ceiling to their Christian life. The Bible says that when we're saved, we have the Holy Spirit in us, but then Jesus also, he's, as he's preparing to go to heaven, tells them to wait for the promise of the Father. The Holy Spirit will empower you and I and give us meaningful purpose. That's fulfillment. That's another thing the Holy Spirit does. He, he gives purpose and direction. After spending three and a half years with Jesus, Peter denied the Lord three times, right? The third time he went so far as to say, call down curses on himself. And he swore to them, I don't know this guy. Could you imagine the lie? I don't even, Jesus, I don't even know him. All this commotion going on, I, I really haven't even heard about the guy. Now that's a stretch. But he does it three times. He and finally, he says, I don't even know the guy. He curses. And, and the same Peter, seven weeks later, is preaching in front of an antagonistic crowd that says, you're all drunk. And 3,000 people come to Christ. What changed? Well, we know what changed, right? Not only had Jesus risen from the grave and revealed himself to them, but they spent time in that upper room. And the Bible said when they wait on the Lord in Acts chapter 2, they were in one accord with, with one purpose and direction, in essence, and in one mind, praying for the same thing, waiting for the promise of the Father. And the Holy Spirit was poured on that room, and it was a holy ruckus. People thought they were drunk. It was, it was, a, it was a, 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 a messy, glorious thing. That God did. And now 3,000 come to his preaching. What made him so bold instead of hiding and disowning Christ? The answer is simple. Between his denial of Christ at Passover and his mighty soul winning sermon less than two months later, he experienced the first New Testament day of Pentecost. Peter was among the 120 who received heaven sent baptism by the Holy Spirit. This is something we don't talk much about. You don't hear people talk about being baptized in the Holy Spirit, maybe, or, or speaking in tongues on a Sunday morning, especially we don't want to scare any new people that might be listening. Do you have fear? I think Peter had fear. Do you have doubts? In those moments, Peter had doubts. But what became of him after the Holy Spirit? Boldness. Boldness to share the hope of Christ. And, and we, we understand that that came from his life. Being filled with the Holy Spirit is really significant. God desires every one to receive this gift. I'm going to say that again. God desires every one to receive this gift. It is the natural order. You are intended, your life and my life are intended to be filled with this Holy Spirit. It's like going to the ocean. And buying a kite, and me and the boys and Pam, we like to do this, and we, we have kites, and we'll go to the ocean, and we'll go to the beach. And the kite is great, and we can put it together, and we, have, we got this one kite, one time it was a big box-looking kite. I, never, I didn't even think we could fly it, it was so enormous. But I, I tell you, once we got that kite together, and, we, and, we, and the wind came in, we started going, sort of going up, and it was huge, and it was awesome to look at, and it was beautiful, and the skyline is filled with all these people flying these kites. I realize that the kite has fulfilled its purpose. That the wind has, has encompassed the sails of that thing, and that thing is flying in the sky, and its multicolors are, are just on display, and it's up there bold, because the wind has caught the sails, and it is up there. You and I are intended to be the recipients of the wind of the Holy Spirit. We are intended to be filled with His power. If we want every believer, Scripture says, needs to be filled or can be filled with the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit and experience His power. Luke 24, 49, Jesus says, I am going to send you what my Father has promised. But stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. 
Acts 1-4, on one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Were they already saved? Yeah. Did they already believe in Jesus? Yeah. Were they baptized in the Holy Spirit? Apparently not. God had a gift. So God makes a distinction between the spirit that he gives at salvation. The Bible says the spirit comes into our life when we are saved as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. And then there is this thing called baptism or gift of the Holy Spirit given after we are saved. It is subsequent to our salvation. We must be saved to receive the gift. But God says it's for everybody. Look what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For we're all baptized into one spirit, into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're all given one spirit to drink. We are all saved by the Holy Spirit. In Matthew chapter 3 and verse 11, John speaks, I baptize you with water for repentance, repentance from sin, but after that me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. They're God's purpose in our life. Desire is that we would be filled with his Holy Spirit. In Acts 19, verse 3, Paul explained that they were to believe on Jesus. They did. Then they were baptized in water. And after they were baptized, Paul laid his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them. They were baptized in the Holy Spirit. Look at it in Acts chapter 19. While Paulus was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? In other words, they believed in Jesus. The Holy Spirit was given as a deposit, just as we read just a moment ago in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, but they had not yet received this subsequent gift called baptism in the Holy Spirit. And they said, no, we have not heard if there is a Holy Spirit. So he told them, and they heard, and to telling them, apparently in this situation for them was necessary. They heard, and they were filled with the Holy Spirit, for they heard them speak in tongues and prophesy. So baptism in the Holy Spirit is subsequent to salvation. You can't receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit unless you're saved and confess your sins to the Lord. But to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the Jesus follower must want to be filled. We've got to desire that. Like that old Sprite commercial years ago. Obey your thirst. Image is nothing. Thirst is everything. Obey your thirst. Are you thirsty? There is nothing we can do to make God move. We can't make him die on the cross again. We can't make him pour out his Holy Spirit again. He has done these things, and they are, in in essence, at work in the world. We are the receivers. We have to open up to receive those gifts. No one's going to tell you this morning, we're going to have an altar time where we're all going to pray together. No one is going to fill your word, your mouth with words to say. If you say, bow tie my bow tie, I want to buy a Honda really fast, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. Nobody's going to do that. I'm not going to lay your hands on you and push you over and, and you know, some weird thing like that we see on TV sometimes and we, we grow with these experiences and maybe some of them when we were a kid, or, I mean, I've seen the most genuine people fall down on the ground and they're just crying out to God and God touches them in a powerful way. I'm not saying that won't happen. What I'm saying is, is that we just want to ask God to fill us with his spirit. I'm not looking to yesterday and the memories and the the effects and the penny loafers and the bun and the hairs. I'm not going back to the antics of what happened yesteryear. But I want the Holy Spirit. And if he wants to knock me down, bless God. If he wants to fill my mouth with words that I don't never spoken before, bless his name. I want everything he's got for me. There are many ways, I think, to receive baptism in the Holy Spirit. Being open to God is the prerequisite to be for him to fill us in any context. At the first Pentecost, in Acts 1.14 and Acts 2, the, those who received were gathered together, apparently in prayer, and it was a group setting. In Cornelius' house, in Acts 10.44, it was also a group, but right in the middle of Peter's preaching, he didn't lay hands on him. He didn't have a time of prayer. While he was preaching, the Holy Spirit filled them, and they just burst out. In Ephesus in Acts 19, they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of Paul's hands. And as a kid being baptized in the Holy Spirit, I've got to tell you, and I've tried to describe it to you, that the wonderfulness and the beauty of what God does in a life, he transforms us. And I, I believe that God wants to get a hold of us if we're up there in age and we're grandparents, great-grandparents, and he wants to get a hold of us when we're just when we're little. I've seen little kids be filled with the Holy Spirit. And they, uh, they've got so much more faith. I think there's less obstacles for them, you know. They just want Jesus to swim with them, and God fills them. 
young people the same way. If someone had a gift for you that would counsel you with God's wisdom, that would comfort you in times of trouble or give you peace, wouldn't you want that gift? I got to tell you, friends, I think it's one of the most overlooked things for the church today. We need to trust God's word concerning baptism in the Holy Spirit. Number one, God promised to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Matthew 3.11, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Number two, God says this is for everyone. Acts 2, verse 38, 39, repent and be baptized, everyone, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you, your children, and all who far, are far off, for all who the Lord our God will call. Thirdly, it's something that God requires for us to seek. He doesn't just say, don't be drunk with wine. He says, be filled with the Spirit. There's no condition, there's no comma or colon. It, it's a fact, it's a be filled with the Spirit. And fourth, the ask to be filled with the right motives. What are our motives? What are our motives? James 4, 3 says, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend uh, what you get on your own pleasures. When you're asked to be, for God to fill you with his Holy Spirit, is it because you want more of his presence, because you want more of God? When you ask God to be filled with the Holy Spirit, why do you ask? Or just a supernatural experience? I don't discount that, by the way. I think we as humans value experiences. We, we, we glean from them, and, and they're very important. But it's not for us just to look back and say, God, do like you did yesterday or, or yesteryear when I was a kid at camp. I want to just like that. That's wrong. God wants to do something in you today that's distinct, that's different, that's unique. Francis Chan wrote, it used to be that if I had a great worship experience, I would ask God to duplicate the next time I came to worship. Like a kid impressed with a silly magic trick, I would pray, do it again, God. But one thing I've learned about God over the years, however, he writes, is that he rarely, quote, does it again. He's the creator, which means that he is, among other things, creative. If we expect God to perform certain miracles or give us a particular experience or blessing, it will be tempting to manipulate or even fake the experience of the supernatural. We want God to have his way in us. We desire his presence. We desire the outpouring of his Holy Spirit. And this morning, as in the first service as we gathered, we ask God to touch us. And friend, I know that in this room, gathered together, that we have all shared heartaches. We have different heartaches. We have different decisions. We have different things going on in life. I recognize that the Holy Spirit is the answer to all. And He is willing and able and ready to answer in me. I know He is here. I say, Pastor, I've never experienced it that way. I've got to tell you, friends, when, when, you're, when you're a dad like me and you walk down the hallway and you hear your boys in their room crying out to God in the Holy Spirit, you know it's real. You know He is real, that He is willing and able and desiring to fill you with his Holy Spirit that goes beyond. I've been in church services where I didn't hear anything the preacher said because the Holy Spirit saturated me and I was, he, was, he was telling me things and working in my life. God wants to do this in our life. Are you thirsty? We're going to gather for prayer and spend about five minutes seeking God this morning. It's just to kind of wet our appetites for a daily experience. But stand with me, would you? Worship band, come.